Hello, Superna. Yes. Uh, I think we can start in a in a minute, sir. Oh, okay. Anjit, sir. Yeah, uh, let me know. Uh, when to start. Yeah, is that is that okay? Uh, so yeah, let's start I in can one minute. Yeah, I will start in one minute, sir. Yeah, yeah, sure. all to this IEEE webinar which is organized by IEEE Signal Processing Society student branch of IIT Kharagpur. Let me introduce you all to the speaker who I am happy to say that he is also an alumni of IIT Kharagpur. Everyone would have nodded <laughs> to that. Okay. So today's speaker is to Dr. Anjit George who is currently a research associate with Biometric Society and Privacy Group at EDIA Research Institute of Switzerland. In 2017, he received his PhD degree from IIT Kharagpur and then he joined Samsung Research Institute as a researcher in machine learning. His research interests include real-time signal and image processing, computer vision and machine learning with a special focus on biometrics. Presently, he is concentrating on developing TAC detection algorithm to ensure a secure face presentation in ODIN program of Intelligence Advanced Research Project Activity, which is shortly known as IARPA. And today he will be speaking on the title, Secure Face Recognition, Countermeasures for Presentation Attacks. Then before starting the talk, uh, I just want to say everyone that uh, the question answers will be taken after the session completes. So attendees are requested to leave their questions in the chat section below. So now I request Dr. Anjit George to start his talk. Welcome, sir. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the intro, Subana. So. Uh, Myself, Anjit George. Uh, I'm a research associate with EDIA Research Institute Martini in Switzerland. Uh, as she told, uh, I did my master's and PhD in electrical engineering department at IIT Kharagpur. Today, uh, I'll talk about the general area that I was working in the past year, and the title of the talk is Secure Face Recognition Countermeasures for Presentation Attacks. So, uh, first, let me introduce. Uh, the POP library that we are maintaining and it's publicly available. So we put a lot of effort into making source codes available and making them reproduce. 
reproducible and the both framework is the base of all our open source packages so uh, if you work in uh, biometrics area like uh, biometric authentication presentation attack detection you can probably take a look at this pop package so uh, another great platform from our group is beat uh, which is an online platform for encouraging reproducible research so our group also hosts the swiss center of biometric research which has collaborations with various industry partners for the collaborations and evaluations so uh, one more thing i would like to say is that like uh, idiap is very uh, international and multicultural so if you are interested in internships uh, phd positions of postdocs you can actually uh, they are mostly advertised here uh, in the first link uh, so you can actually online apply for uh, positions which are applied there so uh, let me go to the outline of the talk first we will see a brief introduction about biometrics spe uh, specifically about face recognition then we will see what is the problem with face recognition systems then we will see what are presentation attacks then we will move on to some general strategies to address this vulnerability of face recognition systems and we will discuss some solutions and we will see the conclusions so um, as you know biometrics offers a very secure and convenient way of access control in fact uh, biometrics is one of the major success stories of applications of computer vision most of this edge devices has some sort of biometric authentication method like uh, for new mobile phones you will see fingerprint recognition and face recognition so on and uh, out of these biometrics modalities uh, face biometrics is very popular and it's very because it's very convenient and it's non intrusive you don't need to test the sensor like uh, fingerprint sensor it, it can you can recognize a person even from a farther distance so it's very more very convenient so uh, over the past few years uh, face recognition systems have reached some level of performance which is like which people say as like super superhuman performance in terms of the detection rates but the problem is that like most of these methods the face recognition systems are vulnerable to some of the presentation attacks also known as spoofing attacks uh, as so you know uh, biometrics offers a very good way going back to the presentation attacks so what i mean is that simple attacks such as showing a photo or video of a person in front of the sensor itself would be in a for for, for some systems like so you are coming in my office countries so some fact, of the phones you can actually fool them just by take a photo of yourself then print it out then show it in front of the phone you will be able to fool it like if it doesn't have a presentation attack detection module so at this point it's obvious that there should be some methods to prevent this so presentation attack detection systems try to protect face recognition systems against such vulnerabilities so uh, so it's it's not the case that presentation attack systems are not there in commercial systems so most of the commercial systems have some sort of presentation attack detection capabilities but for simple attacks like if you do some kind of sophisticated attack then depending on the technology that they have deployed for pad you will be able to fool like it will be harder to fool but you will be able to fool it so let's see <coughs> about face recognition and how a typical face system works so so i'm just talking about uh, like a very abstract way about a face recognition systems it's about the inference stage only like when we are deploying and not about the training stage so basically you have a camera which is your biometric sensor say from your phone or from surveillance camera capturing a sequence of images or video now for this image first you do face detection so which is localizing where face is then we uh, align there is some preprocessing which we align the face to frontal face and stuff like that some preprocessing and we crop it so we get a crop face then typically uh, most of the newer pipelines have a cnn which kind of takes in this image and gives you an ex uh, one representation say 128 dimensional representation so uh, we can use this uh, representation from the cnn for 
face recognition. By face recognition, I mean there could be two tasks. <coughs> there are two scenarios in face recognition. One is identification and other one is authentication. For the first one is identification. So basically, it's like asking the question who it is. So it's like assuming we have a representation for different people. So it's like we know that, okay, 100 people have enrolled in our system and we have the representation for 100 people. So what we can do is that we can do a simple, simple thing is that we can do a simple nearest neighbor search or cosine. And we just compare with the database that we have and whoever has the closest similarity is the person who is in front of the camera. So it's basically asking the question, who is it? And the second scenario is verification. Essentially, we are trying to answer the question, the person is the, if the person here in front of the camera is the person he, who he claims he is. So assuming that this person has enrolled before, we make sure that the representations match. So it's pretty similar to the identification, but here the cost, uh, the comparison is just like one to one. In the previous case, in the identification scenario, we had to compare with all the templates. So uh, this is similar to what you see when you try to unlock your phone with your face ID, uh, for example. So it's basically when you're trying to unlock your phone with face recognition, we are just kind of asking the phone, like you have already enrolled and you're trying to match your face with that. And if the match threshold is greater than the matching score is greater than a threshold, then you will be gain. You will gain access. Now, uh, coming to the possible attacks to a face recognition systems, like what can go wrong? Uh, is there something? Yeah. So, uh, so these are different parts of the face recognition pipeline already shown. So it's like there is a sensor and this is where you present your face or fingerprint or whatever. So there, there is a feature extractor, which is a CNN. Then there is a matcher. So there is a database storing the templates. Then there is a decision module and then the final application, what you're going to use it for. So, oh, there could be attacks which target different components of the pipeline. So what you can do is that you can just go and hack the templates and insert a new temp template. Uh, you can kind of, instead of uh, using the data from the sensor, you can digitally kind of cut off the data stream from the sensor and replay old, old data. So there are different points where you can kind of hack the face recognition system. But the problem is that like from this point onwards, hacking the system means like you have to digitally kind of force yourself in. But this point, like whatever you present in front of the sensor, where like instead of your face, if you can present something else, it's it's mostly easy attack, right? Because you can. Right there. Uh, so if you can actually fool the system by presenting something in front of the sensor. So that is the easiest method. And this kind of attacks are known as presentation attacks. So basically you present something in front of the biometric sensor, for example, camera in our case. So this is the type of attack that we will be talking about today. So uh, let me go to standard associated with biometric systems. So uh, the standard definition of presentation attack is that uh, it's a presentation to a biometric capture system with the goal of interfering with the operation of the biometric system. So the key word is that it's the presentation to a biometric capture subsystem. So as I said earlier, so you have to actually present your attack instrument in front of the sensor. So here you can see the picture like so what this person is trying to do is that there's a camera here, which is like connected to a face recognition system. And he's actually wearing a 3D mask. So you see, so it's, he's trying to impersonate at, as this person. And so this constitutes a presentation attack. And presentation attack detection systems is like automated determination of presentation attacks. And uh, basically, the, these are the countermeasures to presentation attacks. 
and uh, about presentation attacks there are broadly two kinds of presentation attacks one is impersonation attacks or imposters and second one is identity concealer or obfuscation attacks so uh, imposter impersonation attacks is like it's a subversive biometric capture subject who attempts to being matched to someone else's biometric reference so uh, it's like it's like what you're trying to do is that like um suppose you get somebody else's phone uh, you are trying to show a photo of him to get access as another person so this is what's happening in this in this particular picture so this person is wearing a mask of another person and trying to get in the system as impersonating as somebody else and the second one is obfuscation attack so here what you try to do is that uh, your objective is not to be recognized to somebody else but not to be recognized so uh, the application scenario here is a bit different Let's suppose you have a like uh, e gate or some airport where you have some kind of security and <coughs> you are a person who is in a watch list and you don't want yourself to be identified as somebody in the watch list Now, uh, I'll show you one video just to kind of see uh, some example of uh, video attacks trying to fool a face recognition system. So let's see this video. The first stop is Backface in Birmingham, UK. It's a small company founded by Tim Millwood that makes 3D printed models for all manner of customers, from filmmakers to government suppliers. Tim, can you tell us what? <laughs> well, this is our 3D scanning rig. Um, it consists of 96 DSLR cameras, which all fire at the same time, and that captures all the data that we can then use to produce a 3D scan. So we're going to we're going to pop you in here. We're going to process all that data, and then we'll produce a 3D printed head. Backface then constructs the model with a 3D printer that builds up layers of powdered British gypsum. Then some final colorings are added and the life size head is ready within a few days. All for For our tests, I used my own real life head to register for facial recognition systems across five phones. An iPhone 10, an LG G7 Link, a Samsung S9, a Samsung Note 8, and a OnePlus 6. We would then see whether the devices would let us in with the fake head. Okay, so this is the OnePlus 6, pretty much opens as soon as we put your face to it. So that's open straight away. Try with the face. Straight away. That's the worst. So this is the Samsung S9 with bright white light, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So we're testing my own face now. Okay, and unlock that time. We try it with the head. Won't open there, won't open there. But you find the right angle. There it is. For the Samsung phones, as with the LG device, it was possible to choose between either a faster facial recognition or standard. The faster the recognition, the less secure. Alright, this is the Samsung Note 8. This is actually not bad. Okay, so we turn faster recognition on. It recognizes my face, so faster recognition is just the weaker version of face recognition. Let's see if the face works. Okay, so yeah, faster recognition on that one, the right angle opens it up. Okay, so we're now going to test on a softer, warmer light because we think that it's going to work a little bit better. Now we're going to try it with the slightly harder facial recognition. It's a slower version of facial recognition, so it's stripping more secure. And we'll try it with my normal face.
Oracle's heavy investment in the security of Face ID really does seem to have paid off here. So, uh, from this video, you get an idea of what presentation attacks are and how it affects parametric authentication systems. Like, uh, here you see that the Face ID from iPhone performs better since it uses multiple channels of data. That's like the Face ID uses like RGB images and Another video. The first stop was Backface in Birmingham, UK. It's a small company founded by Tim Millwood that makes. Two yeah. So here is another video from Wall Street Journal. Uh, this one is stress testing the Face ID from Apple. But this is the new iPhone X, and its new facial recognition is on par with some recent science fiction. But how well does it work? And can you fool it? To find out, I run it through.
actually tried to fool uh, Visai D. So they actually made some system like this. So it's like a 3D shape and there were some printed Im uh, printed images on top and silicon nose and some 3D printed frame and everything. So it's a very sophisticated system and allegedly they were able to fool the face ID. So you can see that it's like, if you know more details about the system, you can actually look at like, uh, so if the face ID is looking at the infrared uh, reflectivity, you can try to use materials with that kind of reflective properties and if it's looking at the skin temperature or something then you can actually <coughs> make the regions artificially hot and uh, like if you put a lot of so uh, so now let me give you a general overview of the type of attacks so uh, from the videos we can already see in the type of attacks so this is not an exhaustive list of attacks because the attackers are always more creative in identifying loopholes in the current face recognition systems and PAD systems. So, uh, very broadly, uh, the presentation attack instruments, uh, what do you mean by presentation attack instrument? It's the what is the characteristics that you use to fool the face recognition systems. Like, if it's a photo attack, it's the photo. So, for example, uh, here the presentation attack instrument could be 2D or 3D very broadly and it could be static or dynamic. For example, uh, one example of 2D static uh, attack would be photos because it's not moving, it's just a snapshot. And an example of 2D dynamic one would be like a video replay. So you, somebody records a video of you in front of the camera, then you replace with the tablet or laptop screen. And for 3D static uh, example would be what you have seen in the first video, it could be a mask. Uh, it could be a silicon mask, it could be a rigid mask, and uh, another example could be mannequins. You completely make a uh, mannequin to the skate. Yeah. And uh, examples for 3D dynamic, uh, it, it could be a bit more, uh, you could be a bit more creative in, the, in this side. It's basically 3D dynamic means that it's like 3D and it moves with your face or it's like it can actually move. So, uh, for example, it could be makeup. So you can actually do a makeup in your face and it will move dynamically with your face, right? Or it could be flexible silicon masks, which moves with the face. Or it could be light projection to your face. It's like use a projector, project something onto your face, which also moves with your, like when your face moves, the projection also has to like adapt and whatnot. So there could be other types as well. So it's like always an arms race. Like whenever we are improving something from the security point of view, there could be somebody who is kind of working to find a loophole, how to beat it. So, uh, so uh, already told, like the presentation attack instrument is the artifact that you use to fool the uh, the face recognition system. So, uh, there can be a lot of variation of what type of attacks are possible. It depends on how much effort actually you put in. Yes. Uh, so here. Uh, I'm showing some images some from publicly available PAD databases. So, so for example, so in the first first row, so it's like HQWMCA database. So uh, this is a print attack, this is a replay attack, this is a rigid mask, this is a paper mask, so this is a silicon mask, this is a mannequin, this is something called as a like funny eyeglasses and this is some makeup some tattoos and wigs so it contains so this particular database contains both 2d attacks print and replay and a lot of 3d attacks and makeups and everything and uh, the second row shows some bona fide and so this is a print attack and this is a replay attack so it's like a snapshot of a video replay so you can see that can you actually tell whether which one is like, this is the real capture and this is a recapture of a print and this is a recapture of a replay, video replay. Can you actually tell, can you see, can you find some differences whether it's bona fide or not? It's a bit hard for the human eyes. And the third database is the wax face. So basically this again at 3D attack. So what's, it, it's like, uh, so these are real images or bona fide in the terminology. And these are like 
pictures of the wax faces made from this particular person. So you can see that some of them are a bit like you can actually tell, but some of them are actually a bit hard to tell. Say these ones, like it will be very hard for even humans to tell. So there are some more examples of these are genuine and these are photo attacks and video attacks. Um, these again are images from So uh, there are some challenging attacks as well. Like, so if somebody is wearing a wig, so facial hair, like, can you call it as an attack? So these are kind of open questions. So it's like light makeup. So it's like if you do a heavy makeup, then you can say, okay, you can actually fool the face recognition system. But like if you wear a light makeup, these are kind of open questions. Again, with paper glasses. So it's like occluding only a part of face. But this again can constitute an attack because like you can kind of print out some kind of artificial patterns here. It's like adversarial attacks, which can actually uh, fool the face recognition systems. They would go crazy with this kind of attacks. So uh, I have a quiz for you. Like you can, uh, I don't know whether you can actually answer in audio or you can just type in the chat box. So can you spot which ones are real images and which ones are spoof? Some of these images are real. I mean, just captured with the camera and some of these are uh, recaptures. Can you, can you guess which ones are real and which ones are spoof? So if you have some idea, you can type in the chat box or unmute yourself. Uh, second row, first one real. So this one real, okay. And uh, somebody is PS is saying second row. Second row seems to be real images. Okay, let me see if there is anybody else. Okay, okay. So let me reveal the answers now. So uh, so the thing is that so only the first column is real images. So the first row is like, this is a real image. This is a recapture of a print image. This is again a recapture of print. And this is another recapture of a video. Second row also, this is a real image. So this is like a print. This is, a, uh, this is again a print. And this is a recapture of a video. So the difference between these two rows is like, this row was captured in a control conditions. And the second one was in adverse conditions. So you can see that it's not very easy for even humans to recognize whether it's actually real or like a spoof. So I have another example here. So which one do you think is real and which one do you think it's an attack? I'm again looking at the chats if you have any answers.
cells and first and second columns are uh, attacks so this column is real the third one and the second column is like print images and the third column is like uh, video replace so uh, say some of this you can already tell right like you can see this one you see some kind of um, reflection on the surface like here you can see the contrast is actually very high uh, some case you see that okay the contrast is a bit off so uh, the thing is that like if I had modified the contrast a bit like instead of just printing taking a photo just taking a printout I can artificially change the contrast then it will be more harder to tell so the point is that it's not so the takeaway from these examples is that it's not very easy for humans to identify the spoofs it's not easy for the machines either so even simple attacks like photos or video could fool this face recognition example. So in the case, both, both, the, both the images that I had was just like 2D attacks. So if we had some more sophisticated 3D attacks, it would be really hard for even humans to tell. So uh, the attacks could be impersonation, impersonation or obfuscation attacks. So, so from this example, what we need to understand is that the presentation attack detection systems are essential to address this vulnerability and otherwise like somebody can just take a photo of yourself and unlock your phones and get all your secrets so moving to the main topic of today's talk is presentation attack detection so yeah so basically presentation attack detection is nothing but a countermeasure to this kind of presentation attacks so these methods protects biometric systems against presentation attack. So we can think about PAD as a method of detecting if a biometric characteristic which is present to the sensor as real, and the terminology is bona fide, or a presentation attack. It's also known as, like PAD is also known as uh, anti-spoofing or uh, loosely liveness detection. So like what are the methods that people use? like? to detect this kind of attacks so simple like uh, the beginning there were feature based methods like so typical pipeline would look like face detection so then you detect the face then you crop the face then you extract some kind of feature it could be LPP some kind of quality measures uh, optical flow color texture then some classifier this was a typical pipeline like few years back before the CNS and now it's like uh, use CNN with some binary or auxiliary classification. So um, let me give you an idea like why this feature-based method was thought to be working. So in the images you might have seen that when we are recapturing the videos, so there is some quality loss in the sense like uh, images are a bit blurry, uh, the color contrast is not as good because the printers have some limited color gamut and also the sensors also have some kind of uh, non-optimal trans function so it's like when you're recapturing so it's like getting amplified and even if you're uh, uh, replaying a video there will be some artifacts like um, anti uh, some kind of aliasing because of the temporal sampling and um, if you want to detect uh, photo attacks you can actually look at the optical flow because like face is not moving right so that was the idea about feature-based method, but now it's like all superseded by CNN-based methods, of course. So um, uh, this shows the tax. This image shows the taxonomy of typical presentation attack detection methods. So broadly, there are three categories. One is sensor-based. Uh, what I mean here is that uh, so we use additional channels added to the RGB or color channel. So this could be the this additional channel could be uh, light field images, which is like different focuses, could be depth, it could be IR. So some of the commercial examples are Windows Hello that you see in laptops, which uses like RGB and IR and Face ID, so which uses like RGB then depth and IR flood light illuminators. So when you're using multiple channels, they get very accurate, but the cost of sensors is high. So Another option to address this limitation is challenge response. So it's like it's like you're trying to verify there is actually a person in front of the camera. So uh, you can look at 
um, passively you can look at um, whether the, the head is moving, whether the there is some kind of blood flow. You can kind of estimate, try to estimate the heart rate, uh, whether he is breathing or something. Or it could be uh, active in the sense like you can actually ask the user to look at some particular points. So that you can ask the user to move the head in a particular pattern. So if you see that okay, the, the user is kind of responding in the way you ask them for, you can kind of okay say that okay, it's a live person in front of the sensor. So um, there are RGB only methods which involve, involves handcrafted features based methods. Uh, basically, the majority of the methods uh, are recaptured. So it's trying to identify recaptured data. So there is some quality degradation. So there will be some loss in quality of the replayed images. So there will be variations in texture and there won't be any motion patterns. Uh, so that's the idea of feature-based methods. We already discussed this thing. So, but the problem with this kind of feature-based method is that they do not generalize well. Because what I what I mean to say is that, like, suppose you have you like typically for research you test your methods in some database, right? So, if you train some feature-based method in one particular database, and it's true for even human-based method, you train in one database, then you take the model and you try to test in a real-world scenario. So then it's like complete goes completely. Um, completely wrong in the sense like they are very less accurate. So the reason is that the noise in PAD that we are trying to capture is very much dependent on the environmental conditions and sensor conditions. So a particular sensor and particular kind of uh, presentation attack instrument will have some kind of signature. So you would also in previous examples, you would think that, okay, if it's replayed, there'll be some temporal aliasing. scenarios like in your data set if you have VG images and somebody is coming to attack your system with a very high resolution image printed with a very high 1200 dpi printer then it will be hard to detect so uh, now the problem methods for detecting this kind of attacks are deep learning based methods which is basically trying to perform a binary classification by a cnn so uh, there are some binary supervision then there are some auxiliary kind of supervision to make it a bit more intelligent. So uh, the challenge with RGB, deep, RGB PAD is that there are different types of PAD. So this method doesn't generalize well across data sets and it does not work in real world scenarios well and it's not robust against unseen attacks. Like if in your training set, if you have only print attacks and if you are seeing uh, reply attacks in test time, it doesn't work. So it is unable to deal with either the current or future complexity of some types of PAs. Um, it's not future proof. So the problem is that if I'm using RGB channel only, it's not at all secure. And if you want to use it for any critical application, then it's like, it's a no-go. Basically, you cannot use RGB based PAD systems in security critical applications. So one solution is using multiple channels, like for example, in Face ID or Windows Hello. So the idea is that it makes it much harder to fool multiple channels. Like it's faster, just uh, a frame is enough. So basically, hardware software solutions are much more robust uh, with sophisticated attacks. So even with this kind of multiple channels, PAD is by no means a solved problem, and probably it will never be. It continues to be a challenge with involving quality of the PAI and sensors. It's always an arms race, and uh, the attackers are trying to find loopholes of finding to find innovative ways to attack systems, even if we are very expert systems. So, um, so the objective is to develop that what I'm going to present today is to develop a system for detecting presentation attacks, which is very robust to environmental conditions, robust to wide variety of known and unknown attacks, which a set of cheap sensors with very low force positive rates. So, so basically, we need to develop a very highly accurate presentation attack detection system, which is kind of cost effective. 
but it's very secure because the application scenario is like very secure yeah so the challenges here is that limited amount of training data because like for rgb there is a lot of training data out there because there are a lot of face recognition database which contains millions of images but for this new additional channels we don't have a lot of training data and uh, the framework developed should be able to detect unseen attacks this is one problem it's like usually when cnns are trained it trained in a particular domain they does not generalize well like if you have trained a network to classify between a and b and at this time if you see a c then you cannot trust the predictions of the network so our basic hypothesis is that like if you're using multi channels the spoofing artifacts would be visible at least in one channel that we can use for discriminating yeah so this shows the hardware that we have used for our data collection so basically what we have is a inter real sense sensor which gives us three streams which is color infrared and depth and we have we have a thermal sensor called c compact pro which gives us a thermal images so the channels are spatially and temporally aligned with timestamps and camera calibration so we make sure that the all the channels are spatially and temporally aligned so images on the right shows that the bona fide samples and silicon and the silicon mask attack samples captured from the hardware so we can see the thermal res, uh, the thermal images are of low resolution because the camera is like a cheaper sensor but uh, we do align everything so after the preprocessing so or we will have like face crops with all the channels so okay so i'll just go to our approach so um, our solution needs to handle multiple channels so there has to be some approach which can deal with multiple channels and then it has to deal with limited amount of training data and it should not overfit so uh, here we made a cnn which can use information from multiple modalities at once for pad with a limited amount of training data so uh, the inspiration came from uh, another work from our group on domain specific units from heterogeneous face recognition so uh, so let me tell you a few sentences about the heterogeneous face recognition so the task in heterogeneous face recognition is to do face recognition across domains for example you enroll with one domain and try to do recognition with another domain so it's like you have a database with uh, visible images and you are trying to identify an identify a person just using thermal images so the applicability is that so you have a huge you usually have huge database with visible images just like um, your aadhaar database and what if you can do a notification just with thermal images or ir images from a surveillance camera at night so so the solution that we came up with is that to it's a new type of uh, transfer learning but usually when you do transfer learning what you do is that you adapt the final layers to the new task right so instead what we try to do here is that to retrain the lower layers assuming that the higher level layers are shared across different domains so then you learn this with some sami's or triplet laws for pad we hypothesized that the joint representation from different channels could contain some discriminatory information for pad so basically uh, what you can say is that like uh, if it, if the sample is actually real then the all channels would kind of agree on a representation so this shows the architecture uh so basically so there are preprocessed images uh, so there is face detection and landmark detection are performed in rgb images then we do preprocessing for all the channel four channels which are visible near thermal and depth and then we kind of extend the light cnn architecture for face recognition and then we get a representation from each of the channels so this gray path is actually for rgb and this during training this path is not adapted so the good news is that you can just use the representation from here for face recognition as well so uh, basically what we try to do is that we just adapt these layers in the first few lower layers and we just adapt the final few layers so these layers the bulk of the parameters are coming from the intermediate layers which are shared for different channels so essentially we are just adapting very low number of parameters in the training so uh so basically 
the idea is to use complementary information from different channels. So as I said earlier, so the only low-level features, which are called as domain-specific units, are adapted, and the task-specific high-level layers are fully retrained, and the intermediate layers are kind of shared among different channels. So the advantage here is that we kind of leverage the embeddings that we obtain for a phrase recognition task in a transfer learning setup. So it makes it possible to train deep models with a limited amount of training data. So there is not much overfitting because only few parameters are adapted for different channels. So another advantage is that the absolute alignment of all channels is not necessary. It could be like in a practical case, even if the cameras are kind of calibrated, there could be some issues because of transportation and everything. Because since it follows a late fusion strategy, it's like can it's useful in a practical scenarios where the cameras are not exactly aligned. And this approach kind of gives you good cross database generalization. So uh, I'll straightforward uh, go to the database. So it's like this was the database that we use for the experiments. So there are, you can see there are different kinds of attacks, 2D and 3D. So this is the total number of like, there are total of 1,679 videos in the database, uh, constituting of 347 bona fide or real attempts and different kinds of attacks. So uh, this is a metric that you use for the comparison. For the PAD literature, the metric that we use is uh, average classification error rate. So it's like there are three sets, train, dev, and eval. You find a threshold in the dev set, and you use the threshold. You apply the threshold in the eval set, and you find an average error rate between like uh, attack percentage and classification error rate and one of it. Basically, uh, you can think about the ACR as like an error rate. Rate. So, okay, let me go to the results. So, uh, so these are the results in the grand test protocol. So, the thing about this grand test protocol is that we it has three splits, train dev and eval, and each fold contains almost equal proportion of all the attack categories that we have. So, the other methods that we have, like color IQM, infrared, depth, thermal, so these are feature based baselines, basically LBP and logistic regression. And uh, these two methods are like, again, feature-based method, but using all four channels. And this is a proposed method. So uh, we can see that the error rate is 0.3, which is actually very low. So the, uh, the proposed method works well when we are seeing non-attacks. Non-attacks in the sense, like we know that it's a 2D attack or 3D attack, but we don't know the that particular client ID we have not seen in the training set. So, uh, okay, so far, so what you have seen so far is like, okay, just using a CNN with multiple channels, you are trying to do binary classification. It works so far. So, uh, so what is the problem? So, so for non-attack scenario, the results are good. But the problem is that the binary classification approach doesn't work well when we are seeing unseen attacks, because it's not possible to anticipate all types of attacks when you're training a system, which has to be deployed in a real world environment. So uh, here we have an oversimplified diagram here. So assume that we have, these are the real samples and these are attacks that we have in our data set. And if you train a binary classifier and assume that the binary classifier learns a distant boundary like this. And at this time, suppose you are facing some unseen attacks, say which are 3D attacks in this case. So at the classifier would completely misclassified. There is no like there is no guarantee on how it will be classified because the disability is here and the network has seen only these one of it and these attacks and training. So this is one problem with binary classifiers for this kind of uh, problems. And one solution is like if you can do a distant boundary like this, like you know these are the real samples and if you can find a distant boundary around this, so you can actually classify this and this as attacks. Simple, right? So, but the problem is that, like, so picturally I can show like this, but it's very hard to make the bona fide cluster, bona fide or real samples cluster tightly in the feature space like this. So, so this kind of addition boundary can be achieved with a one plus classifier. So that's what we try to do. So, uh, so again, here you can see that so this is the classifier and we try to detect anomalies. So basically 
you can try to learn a register boundary around your normal data so you can detect unseen attacks so um, so what class classifiers comes with its sets of its own set of issues uh, so they try to model distribution of the bona fide class or the real class which could be useful to identify the unseen attacks so basically the objective is to best represent the data so in the one class classifier setup uh, the PID task just becomes predicting whether the sample belongs to the bona fide distribution or not so uh, the classifier does not know which variable these are important for the task and usually in a one class classifier you just like train it's just it's like find okay again space of bona fide data but usually uh, one class classifier setting they does not know what are the variabilities and they does not use the information from negative classes and usually when you are doing comparison straight with binary classifiers usually the performance of one class classifiers are poor in non-attack scenario so ideally you would want the uh, the classifier to perform well in both seen and unseen attack environments. So uh, the solution that we came up with is a one class framework where the features that we use in the classifier are learned in such a way that the feature representation has some desired properties. So the representation of bona fide are compact and clustered together in the feature space. And we actually identify discriminative directions or discriminative features for PD task. And the learning process leverages both the information from known and known classes. Like we are not just throwing away the information from known classes. So again, uh, we use a multi-channel CNN based framework to learn the representation. And uh, and this figure shows the illustration of the distant boundary. So, so if you have seen the expression for contrasting laws you can actually try to uh, understand a bit more so what what's happening is that so this point is the set it, this is the diagram is kind of showing a 2d feature space what we want is that the, the green dots are bona fide representations we want the bona fide or real samples to cluster together very tightly in the feature space so this is the center of the bona fide in the feature space and what we want is that we should we want all the bona fide to come to the center and if there is any attack close to the bona fide, we want to push them apart. But we use a uh, margin-based loss, like so. Uh, from here to here, this is a, this radius is a margin. And if it's already farther, then there is no loss contribution for this kind of attacks. But if there is any bona fide outside or inside, the loss tries to force everything to the close. So again, uh, this shows the loss contribution from different samples in the feature space. So it's like for bona fide, as, so the x-axis is the distance from the bona fide center. So as you go far, so actually the, your, your loss contribution kind of increases. And for attacks, like as you are closer, when you're closer, the loss is high and up to a margin, the loss kind of decreases. And if your sample is somewhere here, then there is no loss contribution, it's already far. So, uh, so the inspiration of this approach came from contrastive laws and center laws. So, uh, so the proposed solution looks like this. So basically, this part is the same network that we have used before. So what we did is that in, instead of in addition to the binary cross entropy laws, we added another loss function in the pre uh, pre final layer. So uh, yeah, so the pre-final output layers are you called as embeddings and which are used as a feature space. So the new loss function forces the bona fide embeddings to cluster together and forces the attacks to be farther from that of bona fide cluster. So once the CNN is trained, we use this entire part as a feature extractor. So we extract the features from this and then we use the features together with the one class GMM. So it's just a one class classifier. We just like use the bona fide representation from bona fide data and just we find a boundary. And at this time, we just evaluate this pipeline. So uh, in summary, the proposed method is a one class classifier, but the representation or the features used in this framework are learned, which 
satisfy the requirements for OCC. So a, a bit more technical details about the loss function. So basically, you start with the you start with the contrastive loss here, and you have center loss here. So what we try to do is that so there is a distance matrix which is like distance of each sample from the bona fide center, and when you're training in each mini batch, you keep on updating the bona fide center, and your loss function is the final loss function for one plus contrastive loss is like this. So basically, there is one component which is like the loss component for the bona fide data, which is just like the distance. It's a, it's a function of distance from the bona fide center. And there is another component, which is actually, it's actually a margin loss. So if it's beyond this point, there is no loss contribution. But if it's inside this margin, then there is this is square kind of loss contribution. So again, uh, so basically we wanted to evaluate uh, our approach with unseen attacks. So we created three protocols. One is grand test protocol we have already seen. So it's like we have all attacks in all three folds. So we have introduced two other protocols, which is like unseen 2D and unseen 3D. So the idea is that, so in unseen 2D protocol, so from the, we start with the same grand test protocol and we remove all 2D attacks from the training and test sets. So in the US, Was seeing attack for newly at testing time. So again, similarly, we have unseen 3D attacks, which is like seeing 3D attacks for the first time in the testing. So uh, directly going to the results. Uh, so the table shows the results of grant and BC is the previous approach, which is giving us a error rate of 0.38. But when we are adding the new laws and using GMM, the result slightly improves to 0.25. So this means that the, even the one class approach works in non attack scenario as well. So, but the biggest difference comes in unseen attack protocols. For uh, this one is unseen 2D protocol. It's actually an easier protocol because like if you can actually distinguish between sophisticated 3D attacks, then detecting 2D attacks is much more easier. But uh, in unseen 3D attacks, it's like you have just trained your system with 2D attacks and at this time you are facing like very sophisticated 3D attacks. You can see most of our baselines like gives very high error rates, but with the proposed approach, the error rate is very low. So, so this is one advantage of the proposed approach. It's able to generalize well, uh, improves the performance greatly by leveraging the discriminated information from known attacks and learning a compact representation. So, uh, in conclusion, the proposed method outperforms the binary classification approach in both known and unknown classification. So, uh, more importantly, it brings a very drastic improvement and detecting very sophisticated 3D attacks. So, uh, so in the next slide, uh, you can already see the Disney plots for these three protocols. So, what you see here is that these are three different protocols for uh, grand test. So, it's like Green is the bona fide cluster, and this green is the non attacks. So, in this case, this red is the unknown attacks for 2D attacks. So, this is with the baseline system, and this is with the new laws. So, in these two protocols, the results are mostly okay because you see that the bona fide cluster is very well separated from the attacks. And this particular case, what you can see is that, like, when we are just using binary cross entropy, so at this time, the unseen attacks kind of overlaps with the bona fide. So this is why the error rates are very high. But in this case, what happens is that when you're using the new loss function, the bona fide representations are tightly clustered and it's like very far. It's not as far from uh, your non-attacks, but still like if we can draw a boundary like this, then it's pretty good. So uh, in conclusion, so um, PID is still challenging since the attacks are evolving, so it's hard to anticipate all kinds of attacks uh, people could come up with. Uh, so um, one idea is that using multiple channels improves the PID performance. So the, basically the idea is that it's very hard to spoof different channels at once uh, because at least one channel will pick up the attack signatures. And uh, one class classifier approach works well for unseen attack classification when the features used are learned to have specific properties. 
And uh, one more thing is that if any of you are working in similar areas, you can. So all our source codes are reproducible. So all the source code and loss function, everything is uh, publicly available. You can actually look at these pa packages from Bob. Yeah, and uh, these are the references. Yeah, and thank you. And yeah, I can take the questions. Uh, okay, we'll be taking the questions now. Uh, yeah. There are a few questions. First one is, uh, won't the processing time be an issue for multiple channels and using deep learning in the phone? Uh, for phone, yes, but uh, let me... Uh, yeah, but the thing is that pre-processing won't take much time. So in this case, what's happening is that we, um, when we're using multiple channel methods, the pre-processing is happening at the face detection and everything is happening only for RGB images. And we, since the channels are aligned, so we can just transfer the face bounding box and everything. So pre-processing is pretty much straightforward. And for the CNN, from the architecture, what we have seen is that like, so let me go to the slide. So uh, the thing is that when we're adding new channels, so it's like majority of the computation is actually happening here. So this part is mostly shared. So it adds some complexity, but it's not like it doesn't add a lot of new parameters. So in that sense, it's not uh, that much demanding, but of course it's more demanding, but it's for security. So it's like, okay. <laughs> yes, um, I think I have answered your question. Uh, uh, second que yeah. Yeah. The second question is uh, about the skew skewed databases, like if there is a binary class problem and you uh -huh. have different number of sam samples in both the classes, one is too low and one is too high, then won't it affect the learning? Of course, yes, yes. So we can actually kind of try to avoid this issue by um, kind of um, some kind of uh, data augmentation. So that's actually one problem with binary classification. So, but when you are using uh, one plus classification, then you try to kind of, uh, even though your attack distribution is not that wide, you try try to get away from that point because you are just using the features from the one class, uh, features from only one class. But uh, it is one more, there is one more thing, like when you're using one class methods, then you need to make sure that you have enough uh, variability in your real class. So it's basically like anomaly detection, but you need to have a data set which kind, kind of covers a lot of variability of the normal class itself. Yes. Uh, so a third question is, why face only, face only, okay. Um, I mean, I feel the question is, uh, why not include the audio of the speaker along with the face? Yeah, uh, so there are multimodal methods, but um, the problem is that speech, uh, uh, for face recognition, uh, even if you have multiple channels, it can be done with just with a snapshot. It's like if you just get one frame, you can actually process and get the output. So you can think about like if you're unlocking your phone, if you want to speak something, it takes some time, right? Like uh, speech is naturally a temporal data. It takes some time. So it's like user experience point of view, it's actually not very ideal. But it can be done. It can be. It can be used to improve the security. But if you have a method which can just take one frame and process it, it's just like you just click your phone and it unlocks. So it much much faster from that perspective. Uh, actually, I missed some points. Yeah. Uh, while in, during the presentation, like. Um, during GMM, you are using features which you have learned from CNN. Yes. yes. So uh, you said features which are uh, satisfying some criteria. So how to uh, embed those criteria into the features? Yeah. Uh, so um, the one class classifier. So what is trying to do? It's it's just like uh, you can think about PCA, and you're trying to find a lower dimension space, and you're trying to find the distance from one space to find out uh, anomalies. But the thing is that then you have to make sure that the 
your bona fide class forms a tight cluster or it's like have a Gaussian distribution or something. It's, it should be very compact. So basically what we try to do is that we try to make sure that the features that we get from the CNN is very compact in the feature space. It's like bona fide data is very compact. At the same time, we try to make sure that the attacks that we know to be farther from the bona fide. So when we are learning a distant boundary around it, like when we have a known attacks or unknown attack, like it will be actually farther from the bona fide. So basically the requirement is that it should be like kind of form a quotient distribution around a mean. And uh, yeah, so it should be compact and there should be, it should be discriminative. Actually, basically you have to use the discriminative directions, not just the mean of everything. So it has to be like, you have to find out the features in that, that, that there should be discriminative information, it should be in the discriminative direction. And uh, GMM is just like, uh, it's, it's basically a, just trying to do a generated distribution just to just to match the distribution of one of the data. Okay, uh, the next question is um, what uh, what about deep fakes? How deep fakes affect the face recognition system? Yeah, yeah, deep fakes affect the face recognition system. Actually, you can fool face recognition systems, uh, but for the uh, it's not a presentation attack. That's why I was kind of forcing. Uh, Telling a bit more about presentation attacks in the beginning. Uh, deep fakes, what you try to do is that like when you have a recognition system, you have to kind of digitally alter something. But uh, here it's like presentation attacks. So if you are generating a deep fake, printing it out and showing it as a video in front of a camera, then it's a presentation attack. Otherwise, like if you are just kind of bypassing the sensor and passing it to the input of the face recognition system, then it's not a presentation attack, but it's another kind of attack for the biometric systems. And yes, uh, this is actually a big challenge now. Uh, people are actually in our lab also, we are working on this deep fake detection. Mm, even deep fakes can fool face technology systems and like can fool big time. Yeah. Uh, where do you use thermal images in face recognition system? I yeah, uh, I think uh, the thing is that like, <clears throat> so usually face uh, PAD and face recognition is kind of uh, decoupled usually for different reasons. The thing is that for face recognition, you have a large database of RGB images only. So what people usually do is that like, and for multi-channel images, there are not large databases. So it's like, it's very hard to kind of train face recognition system with thermal images or anything. So what we people do is that, Already uh, RGB face recognitions are pretty accurate, but the problem is that they are kind of vulnerable to spoofing. So uh, keep it as to cascaded blocks. So there is a face recognition pipeline with RGB images. Then you have one stage where it's like checking using multiple channel images whether it's attack or not. So just assume that you have a block using multiple channel images just for PAD. So if it says it's a real attempt, it's not a spoof, then we pass the RGB image to the face recognition pipeline. This is usually how people do use it because uh, there are not large large databases available so it's usually you do face recognition just with rgb but you use pad with multiple channels so these are kind of cascaded stages uh i have an added question uh, with this uh, like uh, generally uh, the thermal cameras which are adaptable to phone or which can be connected directly to phone so that the front camera works Actually, those cameras are kind of low resolution. Uh, more, most probably, they are two MP cameras. So, um, yeah. whether it be possible to detect the blood flow or uh, uh, the respiration rate which is occurring in the thermal image, so that we can detect the spoof or not? Yes, yes. Actually, you can use uh, blood flow and uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, but one. Uh, the resolution, uh, the resolution is not the limit. The resolution is two megapixels should be enough. But one problem, as I said, is that when you want to use it a mobile phone, you want the recognition to happen very fast. Like when you're clicking the button, you want the phone to unlock, right? But the problem with the blood flow is that you need a temporal window. You might need, say, five seconds to get a um, proper reading of, uh, uh, what do you say? Your, it's a temporal data, right? Like there should be some pattern that you have to observe to find, okay, it's not just one sample data that we have to get. Again, respiration is also like that. Again, for respiration, I think you will need more like 
temporal width. So it's like you cannot press the button and wait for 10 seconds for you to log in. So from usability point of view, it's a bit hard, but um, you can look at the thermal distribution of your face to find whether it's an attack or not. It's, it's not foolproof because you can come up with a silicon mask, you can kind of use some kind of heating to create an artificial pattern. So it's, it's, it's always like, uh, it's not always foolproof, but still you can, yeah, you can do it. Uh, next we have Ashish Kumar. Uh, Ashish, please unmute yourself. Uh, these are used in commercial allegations. Then why don't we shift from face only recognition, only face recognition to audiovisual recognition? Yeah, uh, it's audiovisual is possible. Multiple modalities is possible, but um, in some cases you don't want to kind of speak out, right? Like when you want to unlock your phone, like say if you're in a public environment, you don't want to utter. There could be a lot of background noise. So it kind of uh, and also it's like uh, it's not like audiovisual systems are not spoofable so you can, there is again a lot of research on voice presentation attack detection so it's like uh, you can record somebody speaking something then replay it back in your phone so there are presentation attacks in other modalities like even, even fingerprint many other modalities can also be spoofed so it's like nothing is foolproof but uh, adding multiple modalities makes it a bit more complex because then you need to kind of look at the camera and speak something it may be a bit awkward in a social setting What is the effect of aging on face recognition system? Like you save your face as a child and try to use that data to recognize some one after yeah. 10 years. So, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, this is a common problem with all biometric systems, like at least uh, uh, behavioral biometric systems. So it's like, the, it's, co it's called template aging, I guess. So, uh, so there is already some methods which looks at like what patterns this face template evolves. So there is some some works which tries to kind of correct, correct it but um, in practical setting I think uh, so most of these components are some kind of online learning in the sense like so if you try to recognize uh, today and if you are trying to do it tomorrow if you am if I'm looking eight years old tomorrow then it could be something wrong right so I think the models kind of uh, I create like if I'm growing a beard very slowly over the days then it should be able to recognize but if I'm suddenly becoming 80 years old then it could be it could be an attack but most of the systems have some kind of mm, learning online learning so especially in the verification scenario some kind of compensation for this hello uh, pardon the noise pardon me for uh, noises in the background so okay we have another question what role do the eyes play in face recognition system? Uh, for example, closed eyes and open eyes. This can be used uh, if for spoofs, right? Uh, whether yeah, detecting yeah, yeah. if it, it's a fake uh, face or uh, an original face. Yeah, so uh, this is, um, even, I think even iPhone have this feature. So it's like, basically, uh, you uh, if you want to get in, uh, if you want to be authenticated, your eyes has to open. So the idea is that suppose if somebody stalls your, uh, steals your phone, and if you're sleeping and somebody <laughs> coming in front of your face, so it's it's like a presentation attack, but not like user cooperation. So it's like there are some methods where people uh, the, met the algorithms ensure that the user is actually looking at the sensor and the eyes are open. So it's like a way of ensuring that uh, he's trying to open the biometric application or access the device with his consent. Yes, and eyes are important, yes. Uh, I have a very base, basic question at the last. Okay, uh, I might have uh, lost uh, during the presentation. Um, what is presentation attack and how is it different from that biometric thing in the phone? In presentation, uh, do we have longer time to uh, recognize a face? Uh, uh, no, uh, presentation attack means that like, uh, basically a presentation attack is just like, okay, you're trying to fool a face recognition system. So it's just like when you're kind of taking your phone, trying to unlock. So it's basically looking at my face, 
but uh, what I can do is that instead of sending my face, I can take a photo or suppose I can take somebody else's phone and take, I suppose if I have a photo of that person or a video of that person, I can just show in front of the camera to unlock. So this is presentation attack. So the thing is that like for safety critical applications, you need to have this kind of presentation attack detection capabilities in your face recognition system. But unfortunately, uh, all the, like even though we see face recognition in a lot of devices, uh, not all of them are kind of immune to this kind of attacks. So there has to be some kind of uh, uh, kind of methods to prevent this kind of malicious attempts. And it's more uh, like in personal application scenario, I think it's not that important. Maybe like, uh, I don't think anybody will, will go to the length of manufacturing a 3D silicon mask to spoof your phone or somebody else's phone, one of our phone. But um, assume there's a scenario it's like border crossing or e-gates in airports. Somebody can actually try to, so basically when you're crossing the border, they look at your passport. So there is electronic reader which actually transfers the, your data, which has face image, and they look at you, right? Like basically in normal border crossing scenario, but uh, there are e-gates where you, you, they do face recognition automatically without a person being present. But uh, the biggest problem is that suppose uh, I, if I could kind of take somebody else's passport and if I can do some kind of makeup in my face or wear a silken mask, can I pass as a like a fugitive to get into another country? So these are scenarios where the safety phones we have to make sure that it should not be able to like uh, get accepted just by using some simple attacks such as like there should be at least the ability to detect uh, photos or videos yeah uh, what about biometric template protection is this area still open or saturated since it is linked to security field unless they do something we cannot implement novel ideas for template protection. Uh, can you say that again? Can you, uh, what about biometric template yeah. protection? Yeah, uh, I cannot fully comment on that. There is actually work going on in our group in biometric template protection. But um, one thing I see is that, uh, so people, uh, so there is one question, like whether you will be able to do the comparison that encrypted domain, I mean the protected domain or not. So uh, one issue is that like, if you can have the templates, why can't you just use the normal encryption? So that's one question that I always heard here uh, regarding this template protection. Uh, but still, I think it's a challenging domain uh, if you when you want to compare actually in the transform domain. Yeah, but I feel that there is a lot of criticism about this template protection when you can actually uh, just borrow ideas from uh, encryption domain. But there are uh, like issues with cancelability and stuff, yeah. We have no more questions. Uh, still, okay, one more. iPhone 10, 11, mm -hmm. um, iPhone Max Pro, are recent phones, how effective are recent Titan attacks works on this phone? Yeah. So the thing is that, so uh, I shown that one, uh, when the face ID, uh, the image that I showed like in fooling face recognition, iPhone face ID, uh, it came when the first version of iPhone with uh, face ID was released. Uh, uh, the thing is that, uh, the idea is, is in presentation attack detection is to protect it against like the different, there are different levels of attacks possible in the sense like getting a photo printed, it's very easy like in the effort it takes to make the presentation attack instrument. A video is also simple. Making a 3D mask, rigid mask is a bit more harder because you have to 3D print and paint it. But making silicon mask is much more costlier because the silicon mask that we have shown is like each of them costs around 2000 uh, US dollars to make. So the thing is that we try to like, when we have very secure systems, we kind of offer protection to very like 
even if you are spending a lot of money on manufacturing this kind of um, attack instrument you should be able to protect against that so i cannot comment on this like how uh uh how effective they are but they are still vulnerable like if you are spending enough effort and money in manufacturing the presentation tracks Uh, okay, I I will invite our chair for vote of thanks now. Rahul, thank you, Suparna. Um, on behalf of IEEE Zilla Prison Society branch and IIT Kharagpur, I would like to thank uh, Anjit sir for accepting our invitation and for a wonderful and informative webinar. We are grateful to him for delivering such a nice talk. We are also grateful for the valuable time that you took from your busy schedule, and I'm sure this talk will help uh, and inspire and motivate students in their future work and at certain future opportunities too, probably in their PhDs or uh, in postdocs. So thank you, Anjit sir, once again. I would also like to thank all the participants who uh, joined the session. Also, uh, we have been recording the session, and it is it has been live streamed to Facebook. so after this session you can also check out uh, the video okay thank you anjit sir yeah thank you rahul yeah thank you rahul thank you so if you have any more questions you can always reach out to me and if you are looking for any internships or anything you can yeah reach out to me yeah okay if you want any help thanks sir sure sir thank you